just, I wanted to start our time just by reading this psalm. This is from Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nation said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Let me say a prayer for us. God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, and thank you that you give us so much hope and just so much reason to celebrate today. And in a long season of grief, um, where there have been many tears, God, we are thankful um, that you have brought us back together and that you bring us hope. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Will you stand and worship with us? And you can find the lyrics again at reunionoakville.com. There's a link for the notes. So not only do we celebrate, I mean, I was celebrating the sunshine, but today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And though people mocked Jesus and beat him and nailed him to a cross, here's the amazing thing. Death could not hold him down. The seeds that were planted in hatred and violence in God's power and mercy have given way to new life. He is risen. He is risen. Oh, woo! Okay, let's try that again. That was good. Right, Alex? He is risen. A little bit more, Alex. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, there. I love that. And it is no coincidence that one of the women who find an empty tomb mistake Jesus for a gardener. And Jesus can take the broken, bruised, and dismantled parts of our lives. Listen to this. This is, this is cool. And make them into compost. Use them as fertile soil for something beautiful and new. And in a much more literal sense, Jesus embodies a care for people and creation that throughout history, the Western church has not. We've treated the land as a commodity to steal, abuse and hoard rather than a gift to steward, a gift that pays tribute to our beautiful creator. So today on Easter Sunday, we acknowledge that we meet on land that has been taken at a great cost to the land and the people who originally inhabited it. The lands on which we meet are those of the Anishinaabewaki, the Atawandarank, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis. These lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in indigenous history. And we acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional territory. And so with this acknowledgement, we, as Reunion Oakville, commit ourselves to working for justice for the first peoples of these lands, moving forward in a manner that fosters respect and dignity and equality. And we trust Jesus, whew, the one who emptied himself of power and privilege to serve others, to lead us in this way. Let's pray. So Jesus, we wanna just take a moment, a pause and a ponder to thank you for suffering for us and for suffering with us in our lament and grief. And as we prepared ourselves for Holy Week and Good Friday and suffering and in thoughtfulness, we also looked at Saturday in the waiting of knowing what happened and what was to come. And many of us have been waiting. It's been a long wait in so many areas of our life and lives and prayers not answered and waiting for dreams to come true and, and just waiting for things to be better. And here we are on Sunday now, Resurrection Sunday. You triumphing over death to give us hope and life. And so we thank you, we praise you. This is our time, God, that we wanna honor you and give this moment as a gift to you in thanks and in worship. We pray for grace as she comes to speak, give her power, wisdom, discernment, humility, joy, and love as she speaks and shares the story of you. 
We thank you that you are in our story. Our story is with you. And we love you. Thank you. Amen. Just trying to stay safe here, guys. <laughs> okay, really the sun though. I had to get I had to get sunglasses. You think we were in California or something this morning, right? <laughs> If, <laughs> if 2020 was a year of loss and dramatic change, I feel like 2021 is a year of missing things, right? There's just so much to miss. And I know in the scheme of things, this may sound a little superficial or impractical, but I have to be honest, lately I found myself really missing Disneyland or Disney World, right? <laughs> Like, I love Disney, and a couple weeks ago I had a dream that I was in Disneyland, and I thought, that is what we all need right now. <laughs> Everyone just needs a good trip to Disney. I know some of you are probably too young to remember this, but we used to travel, like, out of the country and, and go to theme parks and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weird. I know. Um, I love Disney. It hasn't always been this way, though. Okay? My first trip to Disney, I was, like, six or seven years old. I was with my family. And I was so excited to go on the Matterhorn. If you've never been to Disney, the Matterhorn is basically like this really tall mountain. It's not that scary. Like there's not a lot of loop-de-loops. There's no loop-de-loops actually. Um, and so, but I was really excited and, and we get on the ride and my mom and my sisters, they have their hands in there. They're like, whoa, Grace, put your hands in there. And I'm like gripping the bar for dear life. I was so scared. And I shamelessly cried out, Dad, make it stop. <laughs> And the really funny thing is, many of you know my dad played in the NFL. He's a big guy, like over six feet tall. He's crammed into this little Disney car. And he shamelessly yells back to me, I wish I could, Grace, but I can't. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, we both sat out the next ride. Uh, we got a churro and we let my mom uh, and my sisters have some fun. But isn't that the worst about a roller coaster? It's like once you're on it, you're just on it. Like it, it, you can't get off. You just have to, you just have to ride it till the end. And hasn't so much of life felt like that recently? Like you just, you can't make it stop. There's all these things I bet that you wish that you could fix or you wish you could make better and you just can't. You know, maybe, maybe right now it's like, it's your marriage. It just feels really hard. Like you're having the same conflict over and over again and you feel like I can't fix it or, or maybe it's your friend or, or your kid's mental health. You see them struggling in school and it's like there's not really much that you can do about it. Maybe you look around at the injustice, the racism in the world and it feels like you're up against so much. I read this article recently in the New York Times and the journalist was basically saying that he intended to write the article uh, describing a vision of, of justice that could dismantle oppression in a way that was nonviolent and it wasn't dehumanizing and then he he admitted that he couldn't come up with anything it's like he couldn't actually picture it he couldn't figure out the way through there's so much that we just, we want to control, we want to stop, but we can't. At the end of Mark's gospel, the book of Mark is basically Jesus's biography. In chapter 15, it tells the story of Jesus's burial. And what you have to know is, you know, this is after Jesus died. They, they nailed him to a cross. It was a shameful and agonizing death. But right before that, Jesus was like trending. Okay, he was, he was a big deal. There was all this hope and excitement building. Jesus was the guy to know. People were talking about him. Have you heard of that Jesus? He just made a blind man see. He raised a guy from the dead. Have you heard the kingdom that he is building? It's the, it's the one where the meek inherit the land, he says. It's, it's where the last, the people who are rejected, who sit at the end of the table, sit at the place of honor. They're first. See, Jesus had this way of finding all the people who were treated as nobody, who had no power, bringing them into his circle and lifting them up 
people were excited. They were talking to each other, could this be it? Could this be the guy? I mean, it's, it's really hard not to get caught up in that, right? Like, that's pretty exciting. And so you can imagine when all of that momentum and all of that hope comes to a screeching halt. When the people in power murdered Jesus. In the end of Mark chapter 15, it says, as they were burying Jesus, it says, this guy Joseph, he got this linen cloth to wrap his body and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. And so they see where Jesus' body is laid. And then chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus. And what I love about this is, is if you know Jewish tradition, you know Sabbath was a day of rest. You didn't work. And some people were really stringent about how they followed the rules. Like you could only take so many steps because if you take too many, well then that's working. And so I can just imagine these women are waiting for the second when Sabbath is over so they could go out and buy spices so they could anoint Jesus's body. It says verse two, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, the second that they can, they went to the tomb. Now, in your mind, if you're picturing this like quaint little graveyard that they're going to, scratch, scratch that out. That's not where they're going, right? This, this is where the, the bodies of the people who are put on trial were thrown away, cast aside, forgotten. That's where they're going. And so they're on their way to anoint Jesus' body, only there's one small, very large problem. It says, verse 3, on the way they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? There's this, there's this big stone in the way, and they're not exactly Wonder Woman, right? But it says, when they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a right robe, in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Okay, so here are these women. They have these spices. What I love is that they are trying to make something beautiful out of something that is not. And, and I'm trying to imagine if I was them, I might also be doing this because when things are a little chaotic, when they don't go the way that they're supposed to, and when I feel out of control, I just have to do something. Like, just tell me something I can do. You all know what I'm talking about. You bought the toilet paper. You stocked up on the food. Like, as soon as our world went to chaos, you wanted to do something that was in your control. So here are these women. They want to do something. They want to make something beautiful out of something that is awful. But they can't because it's already been done. It's already been done. God has already made it beautiful. They were expecting Jesus' dead body, but he is gone. And isn't that what we do? We try to make something beautiful out of the things that aren't. The situations that make us really uncomfortable when someone is suffering, we tell them, this is building your character. This is making you more compassionate. And surely that is true but sometimes not always helpful. These women wanna make something beautiful out of this. They wanna fix it, but they can't because it's already been done. I mean, can you just imagine them showing up to the tomb to save Jesus and the stone is still there and Jesus is, in, is inside like, hello, uh, could somebody help me? I'm. Could someone come and tie these rags or, or get the stone out of the way? I can use some help. These women didn't have to do anything. 
it was already done. It was already done for them. And this is so great and so hopeful for us because there is so much that we can't fix or make beautiful right now. You don't actually have to do anything. You don't have to save Jesus. Jesus is here to save you. Jesus is here to make something beautiful out of the mess that you are in. All you have to do is follow Jesus. Because Jesus actually paves the way for us. He shows us how to do this. We often say Jesus died on the cross and three days later resurrected from the dead, but most of the New Testament writers would say it this way, God resurrected Jesus from the dead. God resurrected Jesus from the dead. It was out of his power. It was out of his control. He just submitted to God's way. Jesus was like on the roller coaster. Uh, hey, please, can you make this stop, right? We know he prayed that prayer right before he died. God, please take this away. And God is like, I wish I could, but I can't. Like, this is the only way, right? Jesus shows us the way to follow God, to trust him to make something beautiful. And I don't just mean like one day we will be resurrected, you will be whole and you will be healed. That is true. Everything will be made right. But I mean right now, you are a resurrected person. You have the hope of the resurrected in you. It is your story, the story that you are living. God is making things beautiful right now. Jesus surrendered to the way the very end so that we can too. It's, it's a little bit disorienting when you think about it in this way, isn't it? I mean, the women show up to this empty tomb, okay? Incredible hope, excitement. Basically, it means that the world that they were really excited for, the guy they were really excited about, can't be defeated. Like, the people in power can do whatever they can do, but it can't stop Jesus. But look how they respond. It says, after the angel tells them, verse 8, the woman fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Here they, they hear this really amazing great news, and they're terrified. But to be honest, that, that kind of makes sense to me. It, it is a little bit scary because what they're being told is not that God rescues us from every difficult thing, that God takes away our suffering. Jesus died. It doesn't mean that God rescues us from it. It means he's in it and in front of it and weaving it into something beautiful. And that's kind of terrifying because it means there's no way around the difficulty. It's like I said once, there's a pain that leads to death, but there's a pain that leads to life. The good news for us is, is we're already in the suffering. Like, we're already here. We don't have to try to avoid it. We are here. We are on the roller coaster. We are riding. And we can wake up each day fully confident that God is weaving in all of the unraveled threads of our lives. He is weaving it into a beautiful tapestry. Many of you know that one of the really difficult parts of my journey, one of the sources of suffering that I've experienced has just been this journey with chronic illness. And if you've dealt with any long-term health issues or maybe you've struggled with mental health, you know that it can be really isolating. It feels almost like you're living in a different reality, like in a different world according to different rules, right? And one of the hardest things about it for me has been ongoing facing my own neediness like needing people, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> it's much easier like just to do everything on your own and not have to rely on other people. But especially very early on, it was relying on people to drive me three and a half hours to a specialist. It was relying on my friend Lisa, who every couple of months would pick me up from my house and take me to a movie to make sure I was doing something fun. It was trusting people to help make meals that would make me feel good. Because believe it or not, I used to eat Reese's Puffs for dinner. Um, and that, that just wasn't good at the time. <laughs> it was letting people help with medical bills and just extend a, a listening ear. And I've been reflecting over the last couple months 
about how much community and deep relationship has come from something so hard and how meaningful those relationships are and how it's not actually anything that I could have constructed or come up with on my own. It's something that, that God made beautiful. And that's not to say that God was behind this, that God was making this happen to teach me a lesson. It's like God is in front of it. Just like Jesus was in front of this. Did you notice the women, they come to the tomb, they're trying to like understand what, what's happened. Jesus is already gone. He's in Galilee, just like he told them. He told them before he died, I will rise from the dead and I'll meet you in Galilee. But they show up at the tomb. How many of us are still showing up at the tomb? And we just need the eyes to see that Jesus is ahead of it. That he's making something beautiful out of something that's horrible and difficult. Jesus faces the cross knowing it's not the end so that we can too. So this is my invitation for you. If you're finding yourself in a really difficult season, something that feels impossible or out of control, consider asking God for the eyes to see the ways that he is already making it beautiful. And wait expectantly with hope and expectation that God will do something. It may take time. I know the waiting thing is super hard. <laughs> But God will do it. That is the message of Easter. I know, especially in seasons of suffering, it's hard not to feel, you know, cynical or in disbelief or really hopeful. So maybe just have an honest conversation with God about that. Like, I don't feel hopeful about this. But the message of Easter is that we don't have to force something beautiful out of something that is not because God has already done it. God is in front of it. Let me say a prayer for us. God, thank you that we're not alone on this roller coaster. <laughs> thank you that you are like right there with us and you're in front of it, making it into something beautiful. God, I just pray that you would give us the eyes to see the perspective. These women saw an empty tomb, they saw a cross. But there was another angle. There was another perspective. You were waiting for them. You were redeeming the world. God, in your spirit, would you ignite hope in us so that we could share hope with other people? We pray these things in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite our worship team back up here. And you can stand. We're, we're singing a song that might be a little new to you, but uh, it's fairly easy to catch on. And if you don't have a bubbly, we're going to do a toast after the song. So make sure that you have one. And if you need the lyrics, you can find them on our website, reunionoakville.com. Okay, so um, we have a small gift for you to remind you that God is turning these graves into gardens, that God can take the mess of our lives and make it, turn it into compost for fertile soil for flowers to bloom. So each household gets uh, one of these flowers here. They're put together by Andrea Williams. She's an amazing florist. So if you need flowers for something, uh, talk to her. But I'm gonna invite up Alex. At Reunion, we have this tradition of doing, woohoo! Uh, a cheers on Easter. Um, so if you have your drink, Alex has a, uh, a blessing slash um, toast for us. Lord, we thank you for your presence here with us today. We choose to be filled with joy as we remember your sacrifice and sharing in our human experience, your love and your forgiveness. We thank you for walking with us through life and through death. So, cheers to our God who dwells with us. Cheers to our God who walks with us in the valley. Cheers to our God who suffers with us even to death on the cross. Cheers to our God, who is the journey 
and the waiting. Cheers to our God who is the dawn of the new day. Cheers to the resurrection and the life. Cheers to the restoration and reconciliation. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers to our God. Blessings to you, people of the good way. Blessings to you all on this new and glorious day. Blessings through you, the children of God. As we go from this place, may Jesus' light and life go with us, that we will shine to all we meet. Amen. <laughs>